now all have a seat. Um, so I hope you guys know each other much better. We'll be spending at least three hours with one another. Um, so thank you so much for coming down once again this morning. Uh, so with, without any further ado, I'll pass and kick off this whole entire morning and this entire session uh, by passing it over to our tech lead guru to start off the session. Thank you. Hello. Yep. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to our workshop on N11 UX with React Redux. So before we start off, how many of you know React Redux? Oh, quite a few number there. Yeah, that's good. Uh, OK, so uh, we'll first, I'll first introduce the speakers and co-facilitators here. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Alex, who is tech lead at Palo IT. Jonathan is software engineer. And myself, uh, Gurudat, will be uh, today's speakers. Co-facilitators today would be Akilan and Shiva. They'll be helping you out uh, with any problems that you have in setting up workspace or any blockers that you have. Yeah, so please raise your hand whenever you have any issue. So they'll come to you and they'll help you out. Yeah, cool? So the agenda for today. So first, we'll uh, start off with introduction about uh, ourselves and what we do. Uh, Next, we'll straight away dive into setting up your workspace. Then we start off with the workshop. We, ha we have broken down it into three uh, small workshops. Uh, first would be on style components and themes. Uh, why style components and themes would be, uh, first, we'll look into what, are the, what is the library that's available to set up a proper styling architecture. And next, we dive into optimistic UX, how to set up an optimistic UX uh, app, so we'll be uh, using a chat app for that. And finally, uh, the final workshop would be on React performance, uh, how you can make your applications uh, buttery smooth. Yep. Coming to the introduction, Palo IT is a multinational uh, company which specializes in human-centered design, uh, and we also do agile and digital transformations uh, to many forward-thinking companies. We take pride in uh, telling that we are small enough to care, but big enough to deliver. We are around 300 experts uh, from different nationalities and cultures uh, sp spread across the globe in multiple offices at Mexico, France, Hong Kong, Thailand, Singapore, and Australia. At Palo, we have a diverse talent pool, which consists of agile coaches, scrum masters, architects, developers, UX designers, data scientists, etc. So we have uh, everyone from the ideation phase to the production phase. Let's straight away dive into setup and preparation where uh, facilitators will help you out. Uh, let's get set first. Uh, please check if you have the latest version of Node.js. Uh, Chrome browser, because for React performance, uh, we'll be using Chrome uh, developer tools. And uh, you can have your preferred ID. So if you don't have any one of these, please uh, let us know. So we'll pause. If you have latest Node.js and Chrome, then we'll continue. Everyone, anyone? Everyone has Chrome on their systems? OK, cool. OK, so you can clone our. Uh, GitHub repo, uh, which is over here. Also, uh, we'll be providing you t-shirts later on, so you can scan the QR code that's on the t-shirt, and it'll straight away take you to the GitHub repository. So uh, please clone this repository and CD into that uh, workspace folder. Yeah, it's, it's, it's over here on the screen if you can't see that. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, there's an open Wi-Fi network, which you can connect to. Uh, sorry about that. I didn't inform you beforehand. So uh, Shangri-La uh, Wi-Fi network. So you can connect to it. No password is required. And you can use that. Thank you. Once you have cloned uh, the repo, just do a npm install, and you can do a npm start. So you should get a, a quick chat app with just a login page and uh, a home screen for the chat app. So. All good? Done? Cool. So uh, next, we'll look into the oh, we'll look into the uh, boilerplate. Uh, why we didn't use Create React app? Uh, simple reason being for this workshop, we thought uh, it's it's uh, Create React app has too many features and it would be overkill. So we just kept it as simple as possible. Uh, we also put in a cache loader there so to make the builds faster, and we have converted all our relative paths within the source folder into an uh, absolute path uh, using a uh, uh, specific configuration for Babel transform there. So th that's about uh, the bundling and the build tool. Uh, coming to Webpack statistics, we have also put in a script. Uh, I can quickly, sh if you, f for people who are uh, familiar with Webpack, uh, you know that there's a statistics plugin which uh, you can use to, uh, to analyze your bundles. So all that you need to do is npm run stats. So when you do npm run stats, it creates a bundle and it creates stats for your bundle. Uh, I'll give a quick explanation about that. So as you can see, uh, you get a Webpack visualizer which tells you uh, what are the libraries that are taking up uh, more space based on percentage, and you have a more detailed view over here. So you can do npm run stats, and you automatically get this uh, visualization on your systems. Yeah, and there's one more uh, proper bundle analyzer, which uh, allows you to see what are all the libraries under node modules, and what are the libraries that are in the source folder, et cetera. So which library is taking more space? So immutable JS is something that's consuming more space. This is how you can analyze your bundle and find libraries which are taking more space and find alternatives for those libraries uh, to replace them with. So all that you need to do is uh, npm run stats. With Oh, there. So for that, we have created a separate uh, statistics.js. Uh, this is a Webpack configuration again. So you can look into this, uh, and you can create your own stats uh, pipeline for your projects. So we won't uh, dig deep into this. Uh, it's just uh, a quick explanation of why we have put up that statistics.js. Yes?
uh, when you do npm run stats, there are three three uh, separate tabs that open up. Okay. Yeah, you can check there are three tabs that open open up. Like they give different uh, perspective. One would be on the bundle size. One would be showing percentages. One would uh, show uh, the other one is like uh, kind of a, a detailed analy uh, analysis of your bundle, which provides you detailed analysis of your bundle. So there are three tabs that open up. Let's give two minutes to uh, the guys who are having issues. OK, we'll continue uh, because there are a few more slides uh, where we won't be doing any workshops. So I'll try to explain uh, further. And by the time, we'll try to resolve the issues uh, that you guys are having. Yeah? OK, sure. Thanks. So uh, we'll dive into the, our first workshop, uh, Style Components. How many of you know Style Components here? OK, uh, very few. Uh, for people who know style components, uh, it's just going to be an uh, introduction about style components, how do you do themes, how do you pass props, etc. So this uh, would warm you up. This workshop is to warm you up uh, for what's coming next uh, on Optimistic UX and React Performance. Uh, so let me straight away show you this. Uh, this was Google's search engine uh, when it was being demoed uh, in 1990s. Uh, so as you can see, the CSS uh, that was used was uh, very basic. Uh, today, if you see, we have such complex applications uh, where multiple distributed teams are working on it, etc. So 
having a proper style architecture is very important in your apps, right? So let's look into CSS evolution, how we have reached style components today, or CSS and JS. Uh, it's a library uh, which represents CSS and JS. So we started off with CSS uh, in 1993. Uh, CSS was just introduced uh, to style uh, scientific documents. Web was created for scientific documents. So CSS was just created for that. Uh, and nobody knew, knew that CSS would be what it is today. So CSS is still alive uh, and it's doing great. Uh, but we ran into a lot of issues with CSS. First of all, we used to use inline CSS in the beginning. Uh, then you couldn't extend it uh, the way you wanted to. Uh, and ca then came in the important uh, keyword there, uh, which made it even more difficult for us to understand how certain CSS is being uh, read by the browser. So to solve that, uh, we came up with preprocessors, SCSS, less. Uh, what preprocessors did was they brought in mixins, uh, variables, nesting of your uh, CSS uh, so that it's easy to understand and read. But what CSS less didn't solve was a style architecture uh, which will allow you to uh, predict or be confident about whatever styles that you're writing. So after that came in uh, CSS patterns like BAM. Uh, any, anyone over here know BAM? What's BAM? Yeah, can, can you uh, tell what's BAM? Can you explain what's BAM? Yeah, exactly. So it's 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 a pattern uh, block element modifier. Uh, if you take a menu, uh, a menu is a block. A menu item is uh, element, and modifier can be the state like active or disabled state of your menu. So block element modifier convention was used to f uh, write your CSS and also fill up your markup with a lot of uh, CSS uh, class names. So disadvantages: BEM brought in a lot of uh, semanticity into CSS. But uh, at the same time, it even made a markup uh, unnecessarily semantic. It, uh, it blotted the markup. Uh, so we had to find a way to automate BEM. Okay? So that's why CSS modules came in and uh, React started to use CSS modules uh, from the beginning. And a lot of our projects today are using CSS modules. What CSS modules brought in was true encapsulation. Uh, it automated BEM. Uh, so you, you could just forget about your component uh, class names uh, having clashes with other components uh, class names. But CSS modules still didn't bring in uh, the style architecture, predictability, and uh, consistency. Then in 2017, style components was introduced. Uh, style components is a library which implements CSS in JS. Initially, there was a lot of friction uh, because um, people thought CSS is going to uh, come to an end if CSS and JS uh, gets ahead. And uh, also, people thought it, it's not performant. But over the year, uh, in 2017, we have seen that uh, style components has been uh, introduced in many large scale projects and it's been used successfully. What are style components? They're just pure visual primitives. So it's pure uh, visual components. Uh, they use template little uh, notation of ES6. So it means that they blend ES6 and CSS uh, in a good uh, way. So they separate UI from the functional and stateful components. Also, one more thing that's very important when you're working on large, in large teams is the design and development was a handoff previously. Now it can be a continuous collaboration. So you can build core components not only for the uh, browser-based uh, apps, but also for your native apps using uh, style components. So let's get started and create a, a simple style component. And after that, we'll look into the theming of style components and look into how uh, passing props and how to reuse and extend. Uh, and finally, uh, in the end, I'll talk about what's the future for style components. Okay, so uh, please uh, check out this branch uh, and we'll get started from there.
Also, before we start uh, over here, as you can see, we have created for each step a feature branch which has the completed code. So if you're stuck and if you want to quickly switch to that branch and get the final code, uh, you can switch to that branch. So for style components, it will be step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. Uh, so we start off with step one and we build. Uh, if you get stuck anywhere, uh, when we are going through uh, any, any of the features, you can just switch to that and you can uh, yeah, start coding from there. Once you have checked out branch, uh, I'll quickly explain. Uh, we have also put a stylecoms.txt in your uh, main workspace. Uh, here we have actually created, uh, put in the code that which you can copy paste into your uh, components whenever we are trying to uh, do any exercise. But uh, I'll go slow, so you you would still be able to co uh, code instead of just copy pasting. So if you are stuck, you can still copy paste either switch branch or you can copy paste from here. This one? Yeah. Uh, we aren't able to zoom in. Oh, yeah. Right, so there, you, you don't have to worry about the code. Uh, I'll be uh, typing along with you guys, so you can see on my workspace and you can type along. Yeah. Uh, if you want this code, it's already present in your workspace. As I told, if you uh, if you go into stylecoms.txt, so you have all the code there. Yeah. Cool. Let us know when you're ready. All of you, if you're ready, just let me know. Okay, yeah, let's start off. So if you look into the code, uh, we have app.jsx where we have created a rod uh, to style comp. Uh, so basically all the uh, screens or pages are in the roots folder and uh, the components folder contains a lot of style components. Uh, so if you wanna see complex examples about style components, you can uh, look into the components folder. We have created uh, a few uh, style components which we'll be using in the chat uh, application later on. Uh, to keep the work, uh, workshop simple on style components, we'll be just using one single uh, file that would be stylecomp.jsx. Here, as you can see, we have uh, a basic 
uh, React component uh, which just renders a button. So you can do an npm start after you uh, switch branch. And you should be able to see a HTML a button. Uh, Okay, let's uh, let's build a first style component. So in stylecomp.jsx, uh, to use style components, all that you need to do is in your package JSON, just add a dependency on style components. Uh, it, it, it's already been added, uh, so you need not do a npm install again. So now we import style components. So you import style components and we will create uh, a button, uh, a style component as a custom button. So so we use template uh, notation. So and as you can see, I'm just hooking into the native uh, button. Uh, button element. So we need to use back ticks. We'll just give a background for it. I won't be using uh, hex notation here. I'll just use uh, it as light blue. Once that is done, you can now render your custom button. Sorry, I made a spelling mistake there. Good morning. Yeah, it's almost, yeah, doing good. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry to interrupt this important program for a moment. I just want to say hello and good morning, and I hope you settled in quite nicely. Uh, I'm going to be snacks between 10 and 11. We have nitro coffee all day when he allows you to leave, only then. <laughs> you may join us at the Hacker Deck for a nitro coffee. It looks a little bit like a Guinness with a thick foam on top. And we have a cocktail robot there. And the robot reacts to QR codes. You find one of those already on our social media pages on twitter.com slash jsconfasia and facebook.com slash jsconfasia. For now, only the non-alcoholic version. Later today, you're going to get the alcoholic version there too. So make sure you follow us. You get that QR code. Uh, just show it to the robots and make your cocktail. That's about it. I'll yeah. leave it to Guru to make you a great morning from here. And then enjoy. And I hope you all take something home from here. Oh, yeah. photo. You want to join for a photo? Oh, yeah, sure. Just there, so I have you as a host as well. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, everybody, cheers. You want to lean a bit? In? No, I said it was the wrong feature. Perfect. Thank you. 
So you must have your first style component. So we'll we'll move ahead. So next we'll look into how can you pass custom props. It's not just custom props. You can even pass in uh, attribute HTML attributes to your button. Uh, so I'll I'll quickly uh, show you that you can just make this button disabled. Uh, and the button would be uh, disabled. So it means that the uh, HTML attributes are being passed to the styled uh, component. Yeah, now let's look into how we can pass custom props. So what we'll do is uh, we'll create three buttons, uh, a small, a medium, and a large button, and we'll see how we can use the same style component by passing props to it. Uh, so uh, we'll create three buttons. We use a fragment tag. So we have created our custom props, small, medium, and large. Now we are going to read those props uh, within our style component. So let's create a margin so that the buttons are spread out. Let's put in a margin. So now we use uh, template literal notation to uh, read properties or read JavaScript within the uh, templating uh, notation. So for that, it's props. And then once we uh, 
read the props, we can set whatever styling you need. So it's, it's CSS dynamically being modified uh, during runtime. Uh, so now if you, ah, just a minute. so if you uh, look into your screen now, there are three buttons with variable sizes. Uh, this is how we can pass uh, custom props. Sort of in, um, like if we had styles or buttons with brackets, would it be possible to write it in a more yep. traditional way? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. So, if I if I use brackets, it doesn't work because it's mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but would there be a way? I mean, I tried doing this, but this didn't work. Would there be a way to do it? Uh, no, no. It, it uses ES6 uh, template literal uh, notation. So that's the that's that that's what style components comes with. But if you look into other CSS and JS uh, libraries, they use uh, other notations like you can pass in uh, function and yeah, then you can do a lot of things. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Here everything would be passed as props, and then you can dynamically switch. So it's working. Yeah, we'll uh, move on to the next topic, themes. So a style architecture, whenever you're doing any uh, style architecture, you should always uh, think about themes because you don't know when, how big your product is going to grow and how many clients would be uh, buying your product. And you might have to build different themes for different clients, right? Traditionally, how in, in a uh, a simple way uh, using just CSS, how we used to achieve this. So on the body tag, you, if you put up a class called theme light or theme dark, okay, and uh, um, you can use any class classes uh, within for uh, all the elements uh, within the body. And now using CSS cascading uh, or uh, I would say hierarchy, theme light has button dot primary which says background light blue. And theme dark as button dot primary, which says background blue. So what we used to do over here, if you have ten themes in your application, we had to package all these ten themes together and ship it to the uh, browser uh, for the browser to uh, read them. Or you, you could do lazy loading uh, on on similar lines. But now with CSS and JS, you can dynamically change uh, props, uh, variables, etc., and uh, you can achieve this. One thing that style components comes inbuilt with is theme provider. So you can have specific sections of your application running on uh, a certain theme and other uh, sections running on a different theme if you want. Okay, so we'll quickly look into how we can create uh, uh, a theme for two custom buttons and having different backgrounds. So basically by reading props. So for that, uh, we need to first import theme provider And then uh, I'll, I'll remove the props for padding and I'll just give a padding of Once that is done, so you can define your themes by using uh, objects. So we'll create two themes, theme one and theme two. So we'll set the primary color to light blue for theme one. And for theme two, we'll set it as yellow. 
how do you use these props here would be that within your fragment you can call the theme provider and to this theme provider you can pass in your theme object that you just now created so for the first theme provider we'll send it uh, we'll give it theme one as prop and for the second theme provider we'll give theme two now you can copy paste the custom button within the theme provider you can remove the small prop etc We are done with uh, the JSX markup. Now we need to read the theme one and theme two's primary uh, color within our style component. So for that, it's it's very simple. So you just read props dot theme dot primary and automatically your buttons should be themed. So now you can use this theme provider at va various levels. So you can use this theme provider at, uh, at in your index.html at the global level and automatically switch themes between dark, light, etc. Uh, based on whatever is stored in the database uh, for user preference. So we'll move on to the next topic. So we looked into uh, team provider. Next topic would be reusability and extendability. Uh, basically, how you can use mixins. Uh, there is more advanced topic on extend, uh, but if you want to see examples of that, if you go into our components folder, we have style components which are using extend. Uh, for now, we'll quickly uh, see how we can use a mixin and uh, use those CSS variables uh, in two different style components. So, for that, uh, We'll still use theme one and theme two. What we can do is create a constant as base button, which will uh, take in We'll have a custom button and we'll uh, create a new button called super button. And now we can read uh, base button uh, props as mix in within our custom button and super button. So for And for the super button, let's put in a border radius. So all the code for this is in stylecom.txt. So you can just go in there and read about it uh, or copy paste if you are stuck in stuck anywhere. So once that's done, now you can use custom button and uh, super button in your JSX. So as you can see, you have custom style component one, custom style component two. 
one is a custom using custom button style component and the one is using cus, uh, super custom button component which has a border radius added to it. So this is how you can reuse variables, you can define themes, you can have various properties defined and stored in your database and read uh, in the runtime and applied uh, to your CSS. If we had to achieve this in uh, using CSS or even SCSS, then uh, you, sh you should have used a lot of lazy loading techniques, etc. Uh, but now it's it's uh, total uh, dynamic behavior. If you're, if you're done, we'll move on. Uh, that's all about Style Components Workshop. If you want to see more complex uh, examples, you can go into the Components folder. We have created uh, an input which has a lot of complex uh, style component, uh, dynamic co passing props and uh, enabling dynamic behavior. So you can uh, look into it. So what's future of style components? Uh, basically version one had post CSS pipeline, uh, which, was cause, uh, which was increasing the, build pi uh, the pipeline, uh, CSS pipeline for conversion from style comps to CSS and inject it into uh, your HTML document. Uh, the bundle size was big, uh, like 21 KB. So uh, they switched in version two to stylus. Uh, but what they missed is, post CSS was creating a AST, so you could tweak into the uh, pipeline uh, of post CSS and you could use it to do your own auto prefixing, custom auto prefix prefixes for your CSS, etc. and also for left to right transformations. But now that's not possible. So what uh, Style Components team is coming up with is uh, something called as uh, interoperable style transfer format. This would be, uh, this is the first CSS and JS format uh, that they're uh, coming up with. Uh, so you, you would be able to generate AST abstract syntax trees uh, and cu customize how style components uh, would work uh, for your own need. Uh, one thing that we didn't uh, look into was linting. So now uh, style components team has come up with a style lint uh, processor for your style components. So it's production ready uh, uh, linting of your style components, similar to how we could uh, lint SCSS with uh, uh, SAS lint and you're uh, using ES lint, uh, sorry, not ES lint, uh, CSS lint for CSS. So, so we'll quickly summarize. Uh, so we went through, uh, we looked into CSS evolution. Uh, how, wh what are style components? what are their advantages, et cetera. We, we uh, looked into a workshop, uh, a quick workshop on creating style components, passing custom props, themes, reusability, and extendability. And uh, we had a short uh, description about uh, where style components is going in the future. Yeah? So uh, that was our first session. Uh, it was a warm up session. So next sessions would be uh, even more uh, faster and we will deep dive into optimistic UX next after we have a quick five minute break. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So you're ready for the next session? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, before we start, we'll have uh, a quick quiz. Uh, we, we have small gift for you. Webcam covers, so uh, 
We'll go ahead with the quiz. Uh, we'll, I, I don't think we can wait for the others to come back uh, because we're running out of time. Sorry for that. So it, it's, it's, it's easy, but, it's, uh, but you need to read in between lines. So it's going to cover three concepts. I'll explain to you the concepts later on. But what do you think the answer would be? First was, yeah? Uh, offset. Sorry, that's wrong. Undefined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Undefined uh, is the answer. Reason? Yeah? Uh, because the people inject a semicolon after the return. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. So a semicolon uh, is injected, and that's why this object is uh, neglected, and you get an undefined. So this just uh, shows that you should be very careful when you're not using semicolons. Yeah? How about this? Yes, guys. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a string. No, <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> yeah? No. Who is he? In the red, right? So you were saying? Number. Number, no. Uh, okay, finally. It's, it's a function. Reason for that. Can uh, anyone explain the reason for that? Oh, hoisting. Yeah, function hoisting. What's happening here is you're returning foo. So the code below is never going to be reached. So foo is equal to 10 is never reached. But however, function foo would be hoisted to top of this function, right? So that's why it's it's a function. Yeah? So now let's get serious. Let's see what this would be. Sorry, I will project it here. Oh, I didn't have the... concepts of JavaScript that we are looking into. First one was when you don't use semicolons, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm old school, so I still use semicolons. So when you don't use semicolons, where you can go wrong? Uh, that was the first uh, question about. Second one was function hoisting. And third one is a little bit more complex on JavaScript. Yes? Uh, e, 3, 1. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's E, 3, and 1. So what we're looking at here is closures. So when you're doing foo, bash, bar, uh, go equal to this. And if you're calling go, go is in closure, the global space there. So when you do go up, it's going to print three. And when you do foo, bash, bar, it's, it's, it, the closure would be within bar. But however, the x is red on top of that, so it's x is equal to 1, so it's 3 comma 1. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, and uh, we'll continue with our next workshop.
seem to be Hello. Okay. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, we're going to do a chat app, uh, and we're going to apply some uh, optimistic UI or updates on chat on the chat app as well. So before I continue, can I have a show of, of hands who doesn't know what does we mean by optimistic UI? No. Okay. So optimistic UI. Here's the the description, but. Ultimately, what it means that when you are sending something to the server and you are sure that 80 90 percent it will not return you an error, right? You update the UI first without waiting for the server to get back to you if something passed or failed. So, you give a psychological uh, uh, speed to the user that you know everything is fast. So, very uh, one example that we can know is uh, if you use WhatsApp, right? When you send. The chat come out first without saying that you know there's a loading or waiting for the server to get back to say have it been successfully delivered. So you will just show, and then you have a they go a, a, a step further with the ticks to show that it did, if, if it's delivered or have the user read if you have uh, those option on. So this is what optimistic UI is, and uh, today so we're going to build a chat app, right? Um, and then we're going to see how can we apply this in our React Redux application. So, um, sorry. So the first thing is uh, maybe we can check out the branch. Uh, very simple name. It's called Starter. If you can't see, I uh, have it here as well. Yeah, you can git stash and then do a git checkout. Yes, you have to commit or stash. Your yeah, your previous branch, right? You either commit or you just stash, and then you git checkout Starter. After that, uh, run npm install just in case there's some dependency that is needed for this uh, exercise as well. So if you're done, you can run npm start, and you should see a chat app uh, similar to what you guys would see when you first check out the uh, clone the repo. <coughs> and if you guys doesn't have a Redux Dev tool installed on your Chrome, uh, please do install it as well. Thank you. We might need, you might need it later if you face any problems when you want to debug uh, issues. <coughs> so it's uh is who is is everyone done? Cool. Okay. So this is what you will see. Like uh, on the left uh, is the application. And on the right is a Redux Tech 2. So if you could set up your uh, browser in such a way, it would be good. So if you look at the application, what we can do is uh, we can type in a username, right? You can type in anything, right? And you enter, it will bring you to the chat room. And in the chat room, you can type anything, right? A chat, ha ha ha. Right? But you, this. It's not connected to any backend at, uh, yet, right? So what we're going to do is we already have a UI that has been built up for you guys using stock components. We are going to try and see how are we going to implement this uh, with Socket and REST API. So we're using a mixture of uh, Socket and REST to build this uh, application. So before I continue, just to let you guys know that uh, most of it, the code are already in, in, the, in the code base. We have some code commented out, so we will comment them one by one. Reason being is uh, the shortage of, shortage of time. And uh, we want to go through and make sure you guys understand some concepts like what we are doing in this project and uh, what are the some practices that we find that is good and we are practicing and using it in our project as well. So before we continue, 
maybe we can just look in the folder structure and I'll explain certain things. So you can see that uh, we have like a, uh, this looks like a typical React application, right? Those who have done React, Redux, we have similar folder structure. Things that I want to highlight is uh, we have components and routes. So components are like what Guru go to, went through, is a style component component, right? So if you look, what we are doing here, you notice that all these components, they are named, sorry, they are named very similar to your native API. So that's one thing to take note when you're building components, right? You try to have it as close to the HTML or CSS API. So for example, if you're building a, a flex component, right, you just name it flex, right? For props that you can pass in into your components, right? You can name anything for your props, right? But here, you can see that we are using things like height, justify content, align item, flex direction. All these are very familiar. These are from your CSS, right? You write your CSS in such a way. So the advantage of this is any developer that come to your project, right, is very familiar to them, right? They don't have to learn new APIs or how you are building your components. So this is one thing to take note when you're building your components. So in such a way, it will help people to understand and get up, get up to speed. So these are all the components that we have built. Uh, you can take a look at them if you want to. And these are enough for you to build the chat app. And we have the routes. Uh, in our case, routes are like uh, the pages. So we have the login page, uh, the chat page. So you can see that there are two folders here, the login and the chat, right? So uh, these are yep, just your routes. Next thing that I want to go through is the actions, right? We have actions. So you can see we have a bunch of code commented out. So these are things that we're going to uncomment them one by one, and we slowly will go through how this will uh, link up all our application together. So in our actions, you realize that uh, we are not doing it in the normal way that uh, React or Redux is doing. So what we are doing here is we are using this library called ReductX. Okay, if uh, who haven't heard, who have used ReductX before? No one? Okay, then I will explain uh, what is this and why we are using it, right? So when you create a, a action in your React application, most of the time you create a constant that goes with your uh, action type, right? Because you want to prevent uh, pairing er errors and things like that. But if you notice here, we didn't need to create any constant for our action type. So what Redux Act is doing is you just create, uh, just put a string here, which is your action type actually. And what they are doing in the back is they are helping you to enforce that your actions are unique as well. So they have like some kind of ID that's in uh, a pen, pre-pended before your action type. So if you were to see, uh, okay, so. You can see here the type, right? Uh, is what we write as it is. But if you if you don't put a type, right, it will be an ID. So they're helping you to make sure that this is unique all the time, right? So what they are doing, if you look in our reducer, right, the way. So the way we are using our reducer, we are just importing the action variable that we created. So they are doing some, what is happening is uh, they are overriding the toString method. So when you have an object, this is an object, and you have a computed key, right? What's happening is JavaScript will call the toString method. So this is how they are handling the type for catching the action. So this one thing uh, is actually quite interesting. You can you guys can take a look because it reduces the boilerplate of writing your constants because every action you have all the time you have a constant, right? So you cut down a lot of boilerplate, and uh, it makes your code uh, easier to read as well. One other thing that I want to highlight is the way we are using our writing our code in the reducer. We have this pipe, right? Think of pipe as a uh, a series of functions that we are piping through. It's just like your normal pipe in uh, your Linux and everything. You're piping through an uh, input through the various functions, right? So now what we are doing is we are actually piping the state through these various, various, various functions. So you can see, 
over here, let's just say we have the actions and chat message. Right? What we are doing is we are actually having this function that's taking uh, a payload and a state as well. Later, I'll show you how, where the state comes in. Right? So it's taking a state and returning a new state to the next function. So you're returning the next state to the next function. And then ultimately, when this finish, it will return the state to the reducer. Okay? And then that's where the reducer will get the new state, and then the whole app, app React application will be rendered. So the concept of this, right, we have what we call these are uh, mutators. Right? We call these mutators because they mutate only one part of the state that concerns them. Right? So for example, if you were to look at our mutators, right, you can see. What we are doing here is, let's say set input. I just want to care about this path, input, uh, the name and the value, and I want to set the value to this path. So we are using immutable JS here. So you can see uh, it's a bit weird. You not, you, we do not have like object dot assign, and then we create a new object. So we are using immutable JS to help us to ensure the immutability of our state as well. One other reason why we use this is because it helps you to maintain a very clean reducer. Imagine if you have a very deep state, what you have is you have reducer composing reducer and within reducer, and when you want to traverse to your code, you need to go to this reducer and you thought, oh, this is actually handled by another reducer. You go into that reducer and you realize that there's another reducer that is composing, so it will be very deep and very hard to traverse through the code. So which is why when if you use this, because you can just put the path and you will just go to that value. So if it's hard to understand, just take it as if it's an object, you'll be object.input.name.value. So this is uh, what we are doing. And because the way we are doing it, we ensure that the mutators only handle one thing and one thing only. So it's very small, right? which makes it very easy to test as well. So when you have a very big application, you can have all these, it's very easy to test, and you can reuse them, right? Because you have, you probably have a bunch of inputs, right? You can have inputs and you have the dynamic path here because of the name of the input, right? So that is why we are using immutable JS uh, in this application as well. So that is uh, just a short uh, walkthrough of the code and why we are using certain things. Any questions at this moment, like anything is unsure or you are, you, anyone is lost? Everybody okay? Okay, so we are going to start to try and build this chat application. Um, before I go on, just to let you guys know that this is how we are breaking down the React application. So all the different colors, actually the different components that we have, we have uh, taken them out as a component by itself. So this is just a visual for you guys to see, just in case if you need it. So, so what we're going to do, so we're going to work on the logic only today. So we have the actions, the mutators, the reducers, and lastly, the middleware. So we're going to use the middleware to do the socket connection and the REST API call. Uh, show of hands, anyone have, those who have done React Redux, anyone have wrote their own middlewares before? Anybody heard about middleware? Anybody know what middleware is? Okay, a few hands. Okay, so the rest, I assume you don't know what a middleware is. Uh, I will go through how the middleware is like, uh, but before that, here are the few uh, events that we're going to send. So we have combination of socket and the rest, right? So for socket, right, we have this event at user. And for the rest, we have this API endpoint. Not to worry, this is actually in the code, just giving you guys a visual. And these are the socket events that we're going to listen to. Login success, login fail. So we are going to implement this, um, this login part, right? So what we have to do is actually we need to key in a username. We send to the server. The server will tell us if this user exists. If it doesn't exist, login success. So you give in a login success event. If it fails, there will be a login fail because a user has already existed, right? So these are what we're going to uh, build. So before we go on, just talking about middleware. 
So this is the flow of our application, right? A normal React Redux application. You have a store, right? Normally, yes, the view will listen to the store. You have any action, right? Normally, the action goes straight to the reducer, right? But in this case, we have the middleware, which will handle our socket or REST API, OK? Reason being why we want it to be the middleware, because like if you want to do anything that is related to uh, in, in your normal React and Redux application, normally we have actions to describe something that has happened, right? Or something that you want to change. So you want to maintain the same way where you want to execute your socket middleware and REST as well. So we are, that is why we are using a middleware, because we want to use actions for any changes that we want to make to the application. So middleware, just think it of the actions. We'll just pass through your middleware. You can have a few middlewares. So you'll go through a series of middlewares, actually, if you have more than one. Middleware will intercept your actions, those actions that they need to intercept. And what will happen is um, it can do many things. It can either stop the action from going to the reducer, or it can even dispatch new action as well. So which is why you can see sometimes middleware, you can dispatch new action, and you'll go through again. So this is the concept of middleware. And this is the core part that we're going to build today for this whole application. Right? Um, so without further ado, Let's go to the code and let's go to our actions, right? So the first thing to do that we know that we want to um, add a user, right? Over here, we need to add a user to the socket. So we know that we need, the, like I said before, we need the action. So if you go to the action uh, on line 5, uh, just uncomment line 5, the code, right? I have this add user to chat, right? And we are creating an action here. And we know that these actions need to be handled, need to be intercepted by the middleware. And we need a socket configuration as well, right? Because you need to tell them, OK, these actions, what are the events I'm going to emit? So here, can we open uh, socketconfig.js? OK, so you can see that in this, I have a function called socket, setup socket, right? And in setup socket, I have two other functions that is being written by the setup socket uh, function, right? We have a listener and an emitter. So if you're using a socket, right, you have a socket that actually watch on the event. So in this case, the first one you can see, we are actually walk, watching on the socket logging success, right? So this is where, in this function, we are putting all our socket events that we are listening to. So that's why it's in the function called listener. And then we have another one, right, which is called the emitter. This is where we have, look at this, this is a very similar API in our reducer, right? because we're using the Redux Act, and we're looking on the action. So this action, right, when it intercept this action, I want the socket to emit at user event, and then the payload uh, username. So your action will actually pass a username, right? So our action actually will pass a username, and then this will pass to the socket backend. So the thing is, in order for this to happen, we need the socket object, which will be passed in from this setup socket, right? So now, let's just try. We have two, uh, two events here, one that we're emitting at user. And if it's successful, you should receive login success, OK? And let's just also uncomment this on line 7, right? This is login fail. So if it login fail, so you see, you can see that here we are dispatching uh, another action, right? So if you look over here, when we have the action, right, we come to the middleware. What happens is if we emit at user, you go to the socket, login fail success, it will come back to the middleware and you'll dispatch another action back, right? Because 
here we are dispatching action to change our state okay so when okay so if once we have uncommented that uh, we have the configuration for these two events three events so now the thing is we need to pass in the socket event right so where we are initializing the socket is in store.js so if you can go to store.js Okay, I'll just see. Um, we can from line nine or uh, thirteen, sorry, line thirteen all the way down. We can uncomment, and uh, we can remove uh, line nine. Sorry, yeah, this like this. So we move. I think. Okay, never mind. Um, okay, so you can see what I'm trying to show you here is we have this setup socket, right? We are importing it here, setup socket. And here is where we uh, implement our socket connection. So we have a socket object. And when we call, right, this setup socket, the socket object is being, being passed to this uh, function here. So this function, which is the same function as this, is having access to this socket connection. Okay? So this is how you pass your socket object into this function so that they have access to the or have the scope to this uh, socket object. So this is how we can pass it in. And then you notice that there's a socket middleware here. So what is this? This is where we have the middleware, which is part of Redux, right? That will handle all this. Uh, they will pass in uh, things that you need. Like for example, you see you have get, get state. Get stage and dispatch, right? So where does this come from? This actually comes from the middleware itself. So when you use the middleware in Redux, they are actually passing you a few other items. Uh, get state, dispatch, and the action, actually. Right? So if you can see here, it's actually like that. If Let's look at the socket middleware, right? So right, it's in this. Uh, it's in the middleware folder and there's a there's a file called socket.js so if you look at this example middleware right this is a signature of a middleware so if you want to create a middleware this is the signature you have to follow so it's actually a carrying of three functions right you see that there's a store there's a next and there's an action right in next is actually calling your next middleware. So if you have a middleware in front of example middleware, like middleware one, middleware two, in middleware one, next will be calling middleware two, right? And in middleware two, your next actually calling the dispatch function, right? So your last middleware, next will be the dispatch function, else the first few middleware will always be calling, next will always be calling the next middleware, right? So this is the signature of a middleware. So if you want to build a middleware, just take note of the signature like this. So you see here, when if I call next and I'm passing the action, so when you call next, you have to pass in the action because you are saying that, okay, I want this action, right, from here to go through the middleware to the next one, right? So if you don't want the action to go through, means you want to intercept the action and say, maybe I don't want to do anything, you don't, pass, you don't, you don't call next. And that's how you can, in a sense, silence some actions. But uh, that might not be always the case that you want. So just depend on what are, the use, are your use case, and you just do it like this. So 
let's look at our socket middleware. Okay, it might be a bit hard to see, but what I'm trying to show you is that remember we pass in our socket object, right? Um, okay, this is the socket middleware. Okay, I think. Alright, so here on the right side, you can see that at the end, I'm returning the listener and emitter, these two functions, right? And if you look over here in the socket middleware, you can see that it actually comes through here, the listener and the emitter. So this is how your socket middleware gets access to these two functions, which you have just created, right? And you can see the listener, so it's actually so the middle wave is actually three function call, right? Three is carrying of three function. When you apply the middleware, it will actually activate the first function, which is calling this part. So they will actually pass redux, we will actually pass the store and call this. And that's why. I have the listener. So that means upon applying the middleware, I'm already listening to the events from the socket. Right? But it's a bit different from the emitter. So you can see the emitter is here because emitter is waiting for an action. Right? You say, I want to emit something. I want to emit something to the socket. You use the action to describe that uh, change. So which is why it's over here and waiting for the actions to be passed in. So when you dispatch an action, over here, you go to the middleware, and this is where we intercept it, and then we pass in the action. Right? So if you look back again in the socket configuration, right, you can see that here we are actually looking to add user to chat. Right? So if the action comes here, it will go this and then it will emit. Right? Everybody's following so far, right? So if you have uncommented all this and you should have the socket uncommented as well, uh, let's just see. This should work if we go to the application. Oh. Uh, sorry guys, uh, we don't have the rest middleware yet, so can you just remove it from the uh, middleware? So just have only the setup socket and yeah. So if we were to try Um, we need to go to uh, the component, the login component. 
um, there's this code, the form submit, you need to switch it because uh, previously it was just, uh, we are just doing a history push, so we're just only changing the route. Uh, but you can see here, uncomment this off, we move the top one. So now this is actually dispatching the add user to chat. So we're actually dispatching the username over here, which we actually store in the state when they type. Right, so on every input, we are actually storing every single uh, input in the Redux store. Yep, so just remove it and um, we should be good to go. If we go to the chat application, Anybody able to log log in? No, right? Okay, give me a moment. You can? Oh, this is weird.
Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. Silly mistake. Uh, this action. If you haven't uh, uncomment, please uncomment it. Right, save username. So you can see that uh, over here, right? We have add the user, and save username is actually dispatched by my middleware, right? In the socket configuration, right? See. Uh, here we are dispatching save username. So this is how you can implement the socket into this uh, middleware. So everybody, you can see the. Can everybody log in? Anybody can't log in. So, if you can log in, the rest is pretty much the same, right? Because uh, the rest of our action over here, right? These are all pointing to all our socket actions. So just uncomment all this, right? And we can go to the um, action, the the socket configuration as well. Uncomment all this. Right. So two places. And comment the code in all the code in socket dot config and your actions dot js. So you can see that all of these here are listening to the different events and then dispatching the respective actions to your store. And then they will update the Redux store and your application will be render. Then later we can see how we can have the whole Chat application. Ah, one more thing. We this is for the socket events. We haven't done it for the REST API, right? So because the way we send our message, we're sending through REST, while the rest of the events we are listening to the socket event. So if you uh, have done this, we have a. Uh, In middleware folder, there is another uh, file called rest.js. Just uncomment the code in there. So this is a very simple fetch, right? We are just doing a post on this URL where we post the message that we're going to send later in the chat room. Right, so this is also middleware. If you take a look at it, right, we have the same signature, the dispatch, right, the next, and the action. So you can see that uh, the only difference is that I put I'm putting the configuration in this middleware, but normally you will shift it out to somewhere if you have a series of API calls to make. But for simplicity, I'm just going to put it here. Okay. So once you have uncommented this code uh, in rest.js, the next thing you need to do is to you need to include it in the, the list of middleware that you have, right? In store.js. So if you go to store.js, remember the one that uh, we removed just now, right? There's a setup setup socket, and then there's the rest middleware. So just uncomment at the rest middleware here. Right.
So if this is done, if you try to log into the chat room, right, and you type something or someone type something, we should all be able to see it because this is all connected to our socket backend server. So those who manage to finish it. Um, Oh, yeah, you need to uncomment the code in your reducer as well because uh, the reducer have to change, watch the action and change uh, the state, right? So you need to uncomment your reducers, the, the, all the actions in the reducer. What? 
Monsieur Kotu de Mideto. Oh, yeah, yeah. You have to run command. Yeah, yeah. And someone also is, is sending an uh, empty username as a bug. So we need to add something value, value.username. Because sometimes it's an uh, empty here. Oh, example. okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay, I get it. Anybody say, oh, yeah. Yep, so you should be able to see something like this, where you can see a range of people joining the chat and leaving the chat. Uh, whoever types, we should be able to see as well. Right? Do I need to do the user thing? It's fine, right? He, he has an issue, I don't know if other people have. Maybe you can just say in case they have an error, we should use a name to lower, lower case in the metadata, then to add a checking before the list to lower case. Yeah, it's not empty. Yes, because some people is empty, I don't know what they receive from the server is empty. Oh, just ask them not to type empty, you know what Because just ah. demo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, don't type in empty user name. Okay, just type in. Uh, if you have already typed a u empty user name, you can leave the chat. Come in, go back, right? Then you type in something, right? Because we didn't check for empty strings in this case. OK, so this is a chat app that uh, we have just built. But uh, how does it link to optimistic UI, right? So if you can see, if I have an error message, right? I type this is an error, right? So we, we, we look out for the error name uh, in the server. So OK, this is, well, let me just check. Yeah, yeah, I already told them don't put empty, yeah, yeah. empty username. Because they already joined, right? Somebody yeah, they can leave and join again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they leave, that will be gone. Yeah. Right.
Okay, for those of you who have username error, right? You just add this in your mutators, the append order message, right? Itself, check if uh, the username is uh, coming, right? If it's not coming, then it's not. We will not run this condition. We have those who are not able to complete all. Don't worry, we have a this branch. Uh, not sure. If so, socket can you know, just check out to this socket client done, right? Socket dash client done, right? You have the full working application. So, just check out to that. Then uh, we'll talk a bit on the optimistic UI before we end. Please do a git stash and then you can check out socket client done. Git check out socket client done. Yeah, git check out. No, no, no. Okay. Right, uh, yeah, once, once you have checked out first. So, once you have checked out, you should have uh, something similar, right? And I was saying that, right, if there's an error message, right, you can see that it, it, this, this turned red, right? It was green before, and now it turned red. So, this is actually a simulation of in, in any case, if the message didn't get through, right, the server will tell our application that it didn't get through. And what we have to do is we just need to take different actions. Because in your different um, application, you have different way of handling um, error messages. That if it doesn't go through, let's say in this case, the chat message, right, sometimes uh, you can ask them to uh, prompt them to resend or you could have a logic to say, okay, if this fails, I will try to send it again, right? And maybe for three times uh, before it really uh, time out, and then I will show the error message to the user. So where are we implementing this? If you look in our REST client, right, you can see on this line, right, it's actually just very simple, right? We're just looking for some error message. If there's an error message, we dispatch an action, right, that describe, uh, that change the state on, to 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 show the error message, right. So it's just a very simple, uh, idea, right. Don't need to have any complex, uh, framework or what to help you handle. I know there are some that, uh, there are some uh, optimistic UI framework, or middleware as well to help you handle this, but. It can just be as simple as dispatching an action to correct certain things. So in this case, where we have, we are just correcting, changing it to red, and then sending the resend button. So if the user has to, they can click the resend and resend the, uh, the message again. So there's many different ways you can use to handle your optimistic UI, right? 
So, um, thing, so just to close in summary, like one of the things that we have went through uh, in this uh, thing is that uh, we use the API as close as possible to native standards. So like the HTML, CSS, which I mentioned in the uh, components that you have, right? For any changes you need in the application, always use Redux action. So for anything that you have, it's always standard dispatch Redux action. So it's very easy. Change something, dispatch action. Change that, dispatch action, right? And of course, uh, if you need to have any asynchronous or start effects, uh, uh, you will use uh, we you use the middleware. So that is all. Thank you. Alex. So we hope you had uh, a good time looking into Optimus QS, uh, uh, which I have. Before we go into the next workshop on React performance, let's have a quick uh, quiz on React. So this time, it won't be questions. You will be having the quiz on the code. Okay. Uh, so all that you need to do is please check out, uh, stop your server first, first of all, because you need to do npm install and then uh, do npm start. So stop your server, hit stash, stop your server, do a git checkout quiz. Please don't log in. Once git checkout quiz is done, please do a npm install. Once you run npm install, you can start. Please don't log in uh, into your chat app yet because uh, we get to know when you join and when you leave, so. Now you can log in with your name, your first name. Please keep your uh, first name there because we need to get to know who is uh, logged in. So log in with your first name. Now you can, uh, there's a quiz button there. Please click on that quiz button. And please take this quiz as soon as possible. And whoever, is, uh, uh, whoever gets all the answers right, uh, and it's also based on time. Will get will will be the winner. Yep.
Can you, can you explain why the concept you can do that and you explain so that's good and you see at the end people are still trying to make it work so they need a way still for them so Ben has got a score of 5 so he's not the first to answer he's the first to answer everything right right <laughs> Mixon seven. Hmm. That's really cool. When, when I took the test, <laughs> I, I I thought whoever puts in uh, like submits first wins. So I, I just got three. <laughs> so that that's that's good. So your, your scores are way better. have three, three more minutes. So Rama scores seven, Alexis five, Emil six, Ricardo seven again. Oh, love. Who's love? <laughs> Come on, anyone above seven? Eight. Eight. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. How many of you are done? How many of you are still taking the quiz? Okay, okay. <coughs> oh, another eight there. Last chance, last chance. Yeah, uh, 30 seconds more. Because uh, if you're Googling... <laughs> 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 yes, please, check. Nobody's Googling. Huh? <laughs> 11. <or> 11. <laughs> ah, <laughs> well, ah. Uh. <laughs> oh, this is the <laughs> So everyone is done, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's see who is the winner. So it's going to be eight. Yes. Uh, who is the first eight? Joy, Joy. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, you get so you, you get two gifts. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you. Claps for the winner. Um, <laughs> next. So. Next, uh, Alex, our uh, tech lead at Palo IT, will continue uh, with the next workshop. Uh, it would be on React performance. Let's set up. Okay. It's going, it's going. Okay, everyone. So this is the last session. Uh, I think we are a little short on time, so I will try to go a little faster. Okay, but don't worry. Here, the purpose of this workshop, exercising is good, but what we want to show you is some uh, tooling that will help you to do some uh, performance uh, checkup and also some uh, libraries that can be helpful if you want to optimize the way you code for uh, taking in consideration performance. Okay. Uh, okay, it's going cool. Thanks. So who has been working, uh, who has already tried to improve the performance of, of your React application? Is there anyone? No? Okay, so then maybe this one will be interesting. So 
during this session, the, as I told you, the purpose is to show you some tools, to show you some libraries, and also to try for you to understand what's behind how does the React component work, how that, who they are under to, to know uh, how to optimize it, OK? Uh, so first, you can commit and stash your uh, previous work and check out the React Performance uh, Workshop uh, branch. There are two branches, React Performance Workshop and the React Performance Solution. Okay? So if you want to go directly to the solution, that's fine also. If you want to try to do it, uh, you can also, but I will go a little faster. Then don't forget to npm install and npm start. Yeah, Okay, if you npm start, you will see again the chat. Please enter a name, okay, so that we don't have the same bug as previously. Don't forget to enter a name before entering the chat. Also, if you can, if you are ready, uh, you need Chrome. And for those who didn't have, uh, can you try to install the React Developer Tools? So you can search on Google. React Developer Tools, so this one. So previously, John asked you to install the Redux tools. Now we need another one, it's the React Developer Tools, OK? OK, everyone is set? Is there somebody not set yet? OK, so then let's start it. Um, so once you, s on once you connect to the application, so you can uh, just connect to the chat room. You will see uh, in this chat room, what I did is I initialized a lot of messages, OK, repetitive message, just for the purpose of this, uh, of, uh, this demonstration. Also, I add here another component, which is a mention. It counts how many times people have been uh, writing JSConf or Palo IT in their message, right? If I add Palo IT and JSConf uh, again, the mention is increasing, OK? So nothing, uh, nothing exceptional here. It seems to be working fine, right? Um, before starting the uh, looking at the tools, there's just one thing I will go very fast. For those who are using uh, React already know, for those who are learning it, just know about this, that there's two ways of uh, building your app. One is a development, development build, and one is a production build. Right? The difference is that when you do production build, he will remove a lot of warning that you can see in the console log. So it will make your app uh, much uh, more uh, small. small okay? So don't forget to, to do that. What you need is to add a node on in, uh, in, in, in your uh, application when you, when you build it. So an example for Webpack, if you're using Webpack as we did, you can see in our uh, Webpack that we have in the Webpack two Webpack files, one for development and one for production. If I make a search on the development, I will not find production. Uh, if I make the search on production, oops, sorry. Then you can see here we are setting up the non onf to production. Okay? The other thing for optimization that is recommended is don't forget to uglify or minify for your production code also. So the same on my production, uh, here on my production web pack, there's a plugin for uglifying that we set it here. On development, we don't need to do that because we want to have the whole code loaded in our browser. So we are not doing uglifying, okay? So how to check if, you, if the current app you are running is in production or in development mode? You can use the React Developer Tools. If you look at the, once you install it, you can see here, there's two colors. If it's red, it means you are in development mode. If I click, it tells you you are in development mode. If, if you build it in production mode, production uh, build, you will have a dark uh, icon, OK? So this one is uh, just a quick, uh, a quick uh, uh, check up on, on this build. To, this is the basic stuff, but if you never do React, just know about this, OK? Uh, this will improve the performance already of your production. Then let's try to go deeper. Oh. There's another tool, OK? Here, in your app, it seems to be fine, right? 
I tap is very fast, and uh, it shows very fast here. But let's say you are working, you, your app is working very fine, and now some people are deploying your app in the mobile app. Maybe their mobile app is not as strong as your computer, and they will start to have some uh, uh, latency. The Chrome gives us a tools. If you open your, develop, your, your developer and inspect the tools in the Chrome, you will see here there's a tabulation performance. Okay? In performance, you have on the right here, setting. You can simulate a throttling. So I can voluntarily tell Chrome, can you be four times slower than usual? Okay? Everyone has that? Okay, so I can uh, repeat. Open your inspection, inspect tool in your Chrome browser. Go to the performance. Performance on the right, there's a small uh, setting icon. If you open it, you have a CPU. Normally, you are not throttling. It's work, working as normal, but you can simulate a throttling. Okay? Everyone is set up. Once you do that, I go to the chat again. Now I start to type and start to be a little slow. I feel some latency. When I enter, you see there's only one second latency. It's a little slow, slower than uh, when I, I was not uh, uh, typing, when I was not uh, throttling. Okay? So then we are going to start to, to use a tool to find out uh, if you can find out how to improve this, uh, this uh, latency. Okay? So there's a tool uh, in the same tab that we are able to show this graph. So this graph is called a uh, uh, flam graph. Okay? You can see that it shows when you are running the app how long each component is taking and which component is, uh, is calling which component to be built in the React application. So to do that, you have on the left here a small record button. Okay? So when I click it, it will start recording my action. So just for, just for this demo, Please stop, stop entering uh, anything in the chat so that I will be able to record first and after I let you record. So I do a record. The prefer is initializing. I, tap, I type one character, it's a little slow. I tap enter and I can stop the record. Don't record more than uh, 20 seconds because if you record more than that, your browser may hang, okay? Because there will be too much data for the CPU to process. Okay, so I, let you, I give you one minute each, uh, five minutes to try to do your own recording. Make a simple record. Don't try to make something complex. One, one, and one character and one enter. Then you can stop the profiling. Right? Just, just try to do like Joey. One character. It will be easier for you to analyze the profiling. Okay, so a so few people have done it. We can see in the chat. Right, if you cannot find, don't forget the button is here on the left, record. All right, so I will continue, okay? Don't worry if you didn't have time to, to do the recording. What's important is here to show what, what exactly you can do with this recording, okay? After you can, can try to play with your own recording if you want. So here you see, uh, there's this uh, bottom part which, which appears after I finish the recording. So it's a little hard to read because it's a little stu everything is a little stuck. So I'm going here on the right, the three dot, to dock side the full screen, okay? Now I have everything, I have the same, uh, my console log now appear as a full screen so that I can see more information. So what we see here, the first uh, bar chart here, let me remove this. Uh, you can see when I go along the way, uh, it's showing me the screen. How is it going? So we can see clearly that there was nothing at the beginning, right? The message is empty. So the message is empty, okay. Along here, something is happening. So we tape a, we, we enter the character A, nothing is happening, and then something again is happening, and at the end we can see that the message has been entered in the chat. Okay? Uh, how to read this chart? So the first information here, you can see is the CPU usage. And the color here, this is described here, is how the CPU is being used. And you can see that most of the time here, the CPU usage is on scripting. 
rendering and painting is when he tries to change the browser, uh, the, the, the HTML in, in, in the browser. Okay? Uh, so this is the two parts that will inter interest us to try to uh, find out what's how, how to improve the performance. So if you go a little below, so frame here, I can see how long. If I select just this part here, I can select. Now he tell me green part, how long it took to do this action. Uh, here, interaction. You can see that there's the key character and the key up, which is when I tap, when I enter the A character. And we can see in user timing here. This is why it's interesting, starting to be interesting. We can see the different React component of our app. That when I enter A, he render, again, he executes some rendering for each of the component, the chat. We can see the container, uh, the chat container, and so on. So uh, there's more information below here, OK? Uh, we are going to analyze that a little later. Uh, another thing interesting here, if I go from here to here, I can see a small difference, right? Here, when I enter the character, it's immediately starting to uh, render the component. But here, when I start to enter the what I, I input enter, there was some latency here. He didn't start to render the component. So this is where maybe we can think of oh, something is happening. Why is it so slow to start running a, a component? I just click enter, right? Uh, so how to try to find something? There's another thing here in the main, which is also uh, some event up happening. Uh, the start of the event and the end of the event until the, uh, what's happening un under this event, the child the call. If I click on it and I go here to bottom up, I will see different function that has been called. You have two things interesting. One is bottom up, one is call tree. So the call tree show you, when, after I click this one, the different event call, the child of the event call. So sometimes it's not, it's not easy to read because there's a lot of uh, stuff is coming from React, it's coming from Anonymous call, and so on, and so on, okay? So you won't always find something, but it's still interesting to have a look first, just in case. Uh, the bottom up will uh, regroup together for the same function. If it has been called many times, it will put together the time that has been spent on a specific function. And here I can see clearly, I have a function here called update mention message. The aggregation of call took 68 milliseconds, okay, out of the three, 360 milliseconds. But if you look in terms of aggregation, he was the one taking more, the most time compared to all the other small function calls. And here on the right, you can see mutator.js. So this one is possible. Uh, the Chrome can make the link to your code because on development mode, there's a source code, uh, what's, uh, what's this called, a source mapping. So the source mapping is built when you are building your React code. The source mapping allows the first when we're debugging, when I click here, he will be able to go to the code, okay? So how did I go here, just to come back? I click here on the uh, event press. If you cannot click, sometimes it's a little bug on the uh, Chrome. Do a right click, it just appears this, and then you should be able to click it, okay? Everyone has this? So I go back again to update, I go back here to the bottom up. I can see update mention message is taking a long, long time when we aggregate the time spent. And if I go to the code itself, I can see, okay, here very something very easy. I've uh, written, we are doing a loop for nothing. Okay, this is what make our app a little slow, a little slower. So now, just to show you that we can improve it. So then I managed to find a specific piece of code that should not be there. So I'm going to remove it. So you can find it inside the mutator, okay? Everyone can go to the mutator, and the piece of code is here, right? We have the line, mutator.js, line 28. So I can see here, mutator.js, line uh, 15. Yeah. Maybe there's some compilation, I think, yes. Okay, there was some uh, uh, compilation from Webpack. So there's a difference of line. I forgot this one. But but that's fine, that's easy to find because anyway we have the, we have the uh, name of the function and we didn't eglify or minify, okay? So now I'm just going to comment this code. The code is going to be recompiled, okay? And I'm going to reinitialize it. Just to make sure I start from scratch. I log in again. And I'm going to do another recording. So here is uh, still a little slower because I'm still throttling. Okay, if you want to stop throttling, you can change back the setting here. So I'm, I'm going to keep the throttling just to compare. So just let's have a, a comparison here to see that the time taken is one second, and the time, 
And to remember here, we have a, a small gap of uh, a few 300 milliseconds, about 300 milliseconds. So I record again. So the profiler is initializing. Okay. I do the same, the same action, A, enter. I stop the profiling. And now if I come back here, the second part. Oh, uh, I think someone, yeah, someone joined the chat, so <laughs> let me redo it again, okay? So just for the sake of the exercise, just hold, hold a little on your chat. So I do it again. I enter A, and I stop the profiling. Now we can see the second part here. Once I enter the key, there's no more this latency, okay? If I click on the, uh, on the event key press, we can see that the update motion message is no longer the aggregated uh, time that takes the most uh, time uh, during the initialization, okay? So this one, it was very easy to find because I even voluntarily put inside a, a function. So, but don't forget that if you have a lot of f callback function anonymous, cost, it won't be that easy to find. But it's still a first, a first indication that it can be useful to try to find something happening. Maybe if you have a service file or this kind of stuff, you will uh, find out something is happening in your service file, okay? Um, so the next tool I want to show you, before going to the next tool, let's try to analyze a little more, okay? Because I'm still throttling, and you can see when I enter, uh, I enter a character, it's still very slow, right? Maybe there's something we can do about this. So let's go to the part where I enter the character. It was this part here. Now, if you, if you look at again at this part here, we can see this flame graph. When you see this kind of stuff behind the flame graph, is that maybe something wrong is happening because you don't want to have a flame graph that has a lot of pit, a lot of spike like this. If you look at it, we can see clearly what is happening in the, in the React when I type enter. He render again the chat. Here is the, our different uh, style div component uh, being re-rendered. He rendered the chat container. And inside the chat container, we can see all this chat bubble. All this chat bubble here, you see? All of them are being rendered, which means there's something wrong in our logic is every time I type, he's rendering this whole stuff here. But we, we don't need to render it, right? Because I'm just changing the input here. So are, this is a waste of time. Another tool that will help you to find this easily, if you go now to the React, so this is the next slide. If you go to the React, the React tool, you have this uh, highlight update. So uh, before, before I ac activate it, I know I will remove the uh, throttling because I don't need it anymore. Okay, so I activate here the highlight. Okay, let me put this back on the bottom of my application. And what's the difference now is every time I type, he highlights me the change of your component, okay? The change, what this highlight means, it means he has been, he has been launching a rendering of the component. The, the color that you see here, blue, green, sometimes it will become yellow or red, it's how often this uh, component is being, uh, being re-rendered. So if you see something that is red, maybe it's normal. If you are doing like scrolling or this kind of stuff, maybe you, you wonder, why, why is it uh, rendering so many times, okay? So maybe something is happening. And here, we can see clearly every time I type, he's running the whole application. So this is something that we can try to do about it. But to do something about it, we need to understand exactly how the uh, React is working, okay? So if I just go back to this, uh, to this chart here. In fact, when you see here, when I click this for a tree, or when I, I was clicking outside, we can you remember, most of the time during this uh, uh, React uh, component uh, re-rendering, we can see that most of the time is spent on, on JavaScript, on scripting, not on, bro not on, uh, of, on uh, changing the browser UI, uh, the HTML, uh, and the interface, the CSS, because uh, the part that is rendering and painting, almost nothing, okay? So what, what is taking that much time? Who, who know what is taking that much time? No? Okay, so in React, I don't know if you already heard about this, there are each component of React is building a virtual DOM, okay? Meaning that each component, before going to the DOM of the browser, will keep a virtual DOM, his own abstract DOM, okay? And every time we render, he will, build, he will, uh, ex he will execute the code to render the DOM, okay? The render of the DOM is on a component, if I go to chat, 
is that when I do this render, this is uh, what will be changed as a React uh, element that will be the uh, abstract representing the abstract DOM. Once he has his abstract DOM, what he's going to do, he's going to compare with the real DOM, and he's going to replace it if the real DOM is different. OK? But what takes time here? So what we see, this scripting here, is not the fact that I'm doing a, a call to the socket, that I'm doing a dispatch, that I'm doing a, a, some mutation. What takes time is the, uh, is the building of this uh, virtual DOM. So this is what we want to avoid, because here we can see we are building hundreds of chat bubbles. Each of these is a component, and we are rebuilding it 100 times. And we can see the accumulation make the rendering much more slow, the major rendering of the whole app uh, slower before we get uh, this uh, character being displayed. Okay? So this is what we, we try to uh, do. So how, how does it, how to do that? So in fact, there's another tool that, uh, that uh, React provides for each component. We have a function called should, update, should component update. So should component update is part of the life cycle of a component. Okay? So each component before rendering will execute some uh, life cycle, uh, life cycle uh, function. One of them is should component update. One of them is component did mount, component uh, update, this kind of stuff. Okay? But the one we're interesting is this one. Because you can see in this, uh, so in this uh, tree, each node is a React component. Okay? So let's say, for example, our, our node C1 is our chat. Then our node C3 maybe is a chat container. And the node C6, C6, C7, or C8 is, will be all our chat bubble. Okay? So when it's red, it means that he has been changing the DOM in the HTML. When it's green, it means he didn't change the DOM in the HTML. Okay? But to do this decision of changing the DOM or not in the HTML, he will execute two functionality. One is the should component update. By default, it's always returning true. So for all the components, we'll always say, yes, I want you to update it when something changes in the, in the tree of the, of, the, of the component. And then the second function that he will execute is what we just say. He's going to build a virtual DOM and then make a comparison. Is the virtual DOM different or not? Okay? So if you look at this tree, what happened in our chat app is C1, uh, when, I when I enter something, the state is changing. Uh, and the view dispatch, dispatch uh, the, the, um, uh, the store ch the change the state, and it will, uh, it will be connected to our chat apps component that will start uh, the rendering. So he will say true component update uh, is true by default, and he then he will compare the virtual DOM if it has changed or not. If there's a change, yes, he will change it. For each of these child, you will do the same. The chat container will compare it, and the true component by default is, uh, is true, and the virtual DOM comparison will say also there's some difference because the input is different, so he will render it. Uh, uh, no, in fact, he will not render it because, uh, sorry, I'm on the chat container, so he will say all the message is the same, so I don't need to render it. But he still executed the virtual DOM equivalent, okay? And, after, but, and for each of them, he will also execute the, uh, since the short component update uh, has been rendered, he will execute also for each of the bubble here. What we want to do is to avoid this rendering. So we want to, to play with the short component update to come from this node C3 to the node C2 for the part of the chat container, okay? So how to do that? If you go back to the code, so here you have the chat, right? Which is uh, below in your root chat, chat.js. This chat, reminder, is the whole chat here, right? The schema that John showed you at the beginning. It was the whole component. Inside the chat, you can see I have a chat container, OK? This chat container is here. If I open the index file, I can see my component here, OK? And to be able to, uh, to, to create this function, should component update, you have to make a class, uh, component as a class, OK? So here is already the case. And I put, here, I put you here the function. You can just uncomment it. So what happened, as I told you? This function exists, but by default, he's doing that. He's always returning true. So he, every time we, he wants to render, we just say yes, you try to render it. So what we want to do now is to stop to render in case the chat list didn't change. How do we do that? This function take as the first parameter the next prop. Okay, if you are working in the state, it will also take as a second, character, a second parameter the next state. Okay? In our case, we don't care about the state. We're working out with the props. Okay? And what I do is I look if my current props, the, the chat props, which is the, our list of message, is different from the next one. If it's different from the next one, then it means, yes, I need to render it. But if it's not different, then no, I don't want to render it. Okay? So let's see this in action. 
no, my, my chat app should have been rebuilt. OK, I will connect again. I open again the inspector. OK, let me put it back at the bottom. So I highlight again the updates. And now I click. You can see here, this is not, each bubble is not rendered anymore. If I do now the, uh, the profiling, so I put it back. I do the same configuration, oops, sorry, with the throttling for X. I do another recording. OK, so just to be in the same situation is empty. I do a recording, enter one character. I enter. Oh, in fact, I, I don't care about the enter suite. I, I do another recording. Because what we want now, we, what we optimize, it was the fact that when I input a character, all the bubbles should not be updating. So let's do it again. I enter the character multiple times. OK. So I have my profiling. Wait. OK, let me do it again because people are entering the chat. One second. OK, just don't enter the chat for one second. So I do A, A, A. And let's see this in full screen. Now you can see here, there's a big difference, right? If I look at this part here, before it was taking a few hundred, oh, is it this part? Uh, yeah, now it's very small because there's no much. Thing no, it's here. So we can see before it was taking like a few, one second, now it's taking only 50 milliseconds. And we can see also, if I zoom again a little more, the, the graph is much more nicer. No more all this chat bubble rendering. He just executed the tree. When he arrives to the container, he doesn't render the, uh, the chat container. OK? He just rendered the message input at the end, which is where we enter the A. OK? So this is possible because uh, we are comparing here the chat, which means we are, what we do here, is a, be careful, is a shallow comparison. It means we are not comparing the content of the chat. We are comparing the reference of the chat, okay? which is where immutability is very important. Because if your chat, the content didn't change, you want to send back the same, uh, the same object, the same reference. But if your chat change, you want to send a new reference. So that's why you make it immutable, so that it's a new object that is created with a new list. Because we are not going to compare the list, we are just going to compare the reference. Is that clear? OK, so I repeat. Immutability means every time you, uh, you uh, change something in the object, you are not modifying the object itself. You are creating a new object and, ch and changing, copy everything in the new object and changing something inside this new object, which means you will have two different reference. And this is what is being compared here, the reference, not the content, which is very important to understand why is it working, OK? Because if you have to compare everything inside, it will be much more complex, and also it will take much more time. So maybe you are going to lose time instead of gaining time, OK? Um, that said, this is something very common, right? But it will be a little, uh, a little annoying if I have a mini props and I have to compare all, them, all of them one by one. So what uh, React has done, he has provided you another component called pure component. Okay? So this pure component, you can import it uh, directly from the React. So instead of doing extending a component, I will extend the pure component. Okay? So OK, I'm going to go a little faster because we have only 20 minutes left. And the other thing I would like to show you, OK? Uh, so if I replace here per component, now I don't need any more this should update component because he will do exactly the same thing. He will take all the props of the, of the chat, and he will uh, compare it to see if there's a change. If there's no change, he will return false. If there's one change, he will return true. So if I do that, I expect the same thing happening now in my apps. Mm. Sorry. So let me remove the throttling, because I don't need to, to record anymore. We just show the change in the highlight. So does it work? I oh, know it's not working. Why? Can someone try to? I give, you, I give you one minute, because it's an interesting exercise to do. Can you try to find out why the pure component doesn't work as expected? Because we expect the pure component to do the same comparison, a shallow comparison on each props. 
But in this case, even though I'm sending the same data, the same, I'm doing the same action, he's still rendering the bubble. It means he returned true if one of the one of the props is different. Otherwise, he returned false. And in this case, he's returning true. But it should not be returning true. It should be returning false because my my bubble here is not changing. Okay. So why? If nobody has has found it, I will show you why. It's because if you look at the chat here, when I pass my chat container, I'm passing two props. I'm passing a chat. This is the one we were comparing manually, and we are passing a container ref, which is another props. And the way we pass the container ref, if you see, here is a function. And this function, every time the chat is re-rendering, he will create a new reference of the function. Every time there will be a new instantiation of a function object. That's why even though we are doing pure component, he's, he's comparing both of them, and the container ref will always be a new reference to a new function. So to avoid that, what you need to do is to have a constant. So either, if it's not a function, it's just a constant, like a constant value, you can create a const here so that, so that it will always send back, uh, uh, send back the same variable, OK? So that the reference will never change every time you render again this component. If it's a function, what you can do is we, you create it here in the ref as part of your component. You apply the same code. So chat container, oops, sorry, chat container here. Oops is the attribute. And don't forget in uh, React, when you want to do this, use this inside the function, uh, inside the function, inside the component, you need to bind it, OK? So I will have to bind. This is part of uh, React. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, you can look at the, you can check on the React documentation why you need to bind, OK? There's another library that, make, that can help you to bind automatically, but I didn't install it. So for, just for this exercise, I will just directly bind Say I want to bind the this, the current this of this uh, of this uh, component to the this of this function, so that this this will be the same. Okay. By doing that now, I can tell him every time you render, uh, when you what you pass in the props, I don't want you to instantiate the new function. I want you to use to use the same function. So now let's try to have a look at the chat. Oops. Alex four. I highlight the updates, and we can see it's working, right? So be careful about this. This is one, uh, one trick that can, can happen often. You think you are using a pure component and is doing uh, the correct uh, comparison, but if you are, not passing a constant, uh, you are not passing the same reference, it will uh, change it again. So again, immutability is a very important concept for this to work as a pure component, OK? But the invert is true also. Huh? Don't, don't, don't forget that the shallow comparison is only on the reference. So if you are not doing immutability correctly, uh, it will uh, not do the comparison correctly. And you can have some unexpected behavior. OK? Uh, the next thing I want to show you is another library called Recompose. Because here, what we did to do this uh, shul component update, we had to make a, a component as a class. OK? Because uh, for those who, who knows, or for those who doesn't know, uh, React has many ways of uh, creating this component class. One way is to, to create a class. Uh, the other way is to create a uh, uh, component as a function. When you create a class, we have, we have, sometimes we add a uh, constructor, we add many lines of codes, which could be creating more <laughs> bugs. So some people don't like to do that, especially if you do a presentational component, there's no need to have a, a complex class. So what, uh, what, uh, there's a library called Recompose. It's already installed. If you did the npm install, it's already in the package.json. If you go to Mansion, so Mansion is an example of uh, here of a component that is just a function. There's no class here. But since there's no class, I cannot add this uh, should component update. So this recompose allow me to, uh, is uh, the principle of high order component. OK, it's another principle in Redux. Uh, in uh, JavaScript, you have the principle of high order function. So you do the same with uh, high order component. It's uh, taking uh, something in parameter and will return you a component. OK? So here, I can do import. Uh, oh, before I do that, just to show you, we can see here that every time I type, here you see this part here. If you look at the mention, every time I type, we can see a, a square around mention. It means it's being re-rendered, right? But it's the same, we don't want to render it. We render it because uh, there's no, no point to changing the mention when I'm typing. So I will use uh, pure from... Uh, 
from uh, recompose slash pure. And only thing, one thing I need to do is just pure. I encapsulate, I encapsulate uh, the, the component so that he, so he send back a new component that will execute also a shul component update like pure component. And now if I log in, okay. I need to highlight the update. So I can see mention is not being rendered anymore. Okay. Uh, so there are there, this, this recompose for people who is interested. They have many other high order components, like a shul update to allow you also to personalize your shul component update and other high order components that you can have a look. Okay. The next library, the next things to, to, to know is about Redux, right? We use Redux in our application. In fact, if you use Redux, you don't need to do this true component update or this pure component because Redux is doing it for you. Where inside, the, uh, inside this uh, function, when you do the connect for Redux, when you're connecting your component to your store, there's a multiple parameter. Map state to props, map dispatch to props, merge props, and the last one is option. And by default, the option has a pure attribute that will be true and that will do this comparison. He will. When you finish to map the state to prop, he will compare the previous props to your new props. And he will uh, do the same. He will, he will, uh, he will return true component update to true or false, depending if there's a change in the props. So quickly, here in the check container, I can show you. Um, you can see here, this, this object is not linked to the store. There's, it is just exporting it. So I'm going to link it to the score. Just here, there's a file index uh, redux.txt. I'm just going to do some copy paste, okay? So I'm taking this code. I changed the export. So what I did here is I connected my chap to the store. And I say every time the state, what I do is I send the chat, the chat props from the state. So every time the chat will change, he will, uh, the, this component will be rendered. Every time the chat list will change, this component will be rendered, okay? And here, since we are using immutability, when I do state.getIn, the chat list will not change because uh, the action that we are doing in, when inputting a character will not, change, uh, will not change the chat list. So he will do a comparison, and the same, he will, uh, he will uh, see that the chat reference didn't change, and he will uh, not update the component, okay? So quickly, do I still have time? Okay, I still have 15 minutes. So I can see here, oh, let's uh, remove pure component to make sure we are really not applying any shul component. Shul component by, by default now is uh, true because I didn't, I commented this function and I'm not doing a pure component anymore, okay? So now, okay, just I reload everything to make sure, just to show you that we are really having the latest code. So every time I type, oh, I like to update, the same. Now this chat container that I connected to the store, he's comparing, when I connect to the store, he's comparing the reference. You see that the reference doesn't change, so he's not rendering it again, okay? So this is why some people say you need to split your, uh, you need to split your application when you're using Redux. This is why splitting your application into multiple, linking the correct component to the correct state will also do optimization behind, okay? But behind is still shallow comparison. So you have to understand that this will work the same as the pure component, the shoot component update that we created manually, only comparing reference, okay? And this is why also this one, this part here, doing export default connect and send, say I want to link my, my apps to the whole global state, means you are not optimizing anymore because every time there will be a change on the state, even if it's not linked to your component, he will render this uh, component again, okay? So this should be avoided. Or if you do it, it's really uh, one component that really need to have everything in the state, which may be the case for small small application. But if you have a, if you have a big state with a lot of uh, information inside the, inside uh, your store, then normally you should link the correct component to the correct correct uh, part of the state. Okay. Uh, so comparison is still shallow. Okay. But there's the last tool that I will present you for this uh, uh, for this uh, workshop is a reselect. Okay. So if you look at uh, why, why does it matter that is uh, that is uh, doing a shallow comparison is that here when you do map state to props, sometimes the props that you want to return maybe is not exactly the state inside it. You want to do some uh, some uh, recomputation, calculation, filtering, reduce, or whatever. And since you are doing maybe a new array, 
he will always send you back a new reference of this array. So it means it doesn't matter that he compared the to-dos. Even, even if the state to-do and the state visible filter doesn't change, because of this function, you are going to return a new reference. So the previous to-do reference and the new reference calculated by this function will be different. So even though the, the content can be the same because we didn't change the to-do or the visible filter, it will, it will uh, or maybe we change it, but the calculation returns the same content, it will uh, still re-render everything. So there's, a, there's a, another tool called reselect that allows you to improve this a little. So what does reselect do? The difference you can see here. Now, my get visible to do, instead of s simply sending back uh, a new reference, we are going to use a create selector from a reselect. Okay? So this create selector, what is going to do? It's going to, to take in parameters some selectors, which are these two functions. And if, if the selectors see that the state inside that we are using didn't change, he will return the previous result. So kind of the create selector cache the previous props, the reference to the previous props, and we return it if he see that what you are trying to, to use as a, for your calculation here didn't change. So the same is a shallow comparison, but at, at another level, okay? If a behind, below, you change it, what is comparing is just the visible filter, okay, the, the reference. But this allows you to improve also, this, this solves the first problem that now you know every time it's going to, to return the different reference. Now, in case the content of the state didn't change, he's, going to send, he's not going to do this calculation. He's going to send you back the previous reference, okay? So if you, if you really need to optimize your app, uh, then you can think about this one as a part of your Redux uh, way of building the application. That say, you don't need to think it from the start because uh, maybe there's no optimization to do and this could be heavy to implement. So, but once you have some issue, then you can start to think about if this can help you instead of having to do uh, some manual trick to make sure we return the same reference. This could be useful, okay? So in summary for this session, what I show you is the production build. Don't forget that there's two builds in uh, React. Second thing we show, we, we, we look at some tools using Chrome and the React developer extension in Chrome, okay? Uh, to show this flam graph and to also have this highlight of, of your component uh, live. Then we speak about how does your component update with the virtual DOM uh, uh, recalculation and comparison. The pure component that is doing a kind of a easy way for you to compare the props. And the, the Redux that is doing it for you, if you already, that you don't need to care about pure component and should component update if you are linking the correct state with your, with your component, the correct slice of the state with your component. Don't forget that it's shallow comparison. So immutability is very important for this to work, okay? And I presented some li uh, library like recompose, reselect. You have other library that could help you from optimization. I didn't speak about this one. Why should you update, for example? It's also linked to Redux and will console log a lot of things to suggest you. You are re-rendering re something, but the props didn't change. Okay, so you can play with this tool also if you want uh, by yourself. Okay, so I think that's all for this session. I hope it was interesting. So I think the team, all the team, thank you for, for coming here. Before you leave, we have some t-shirt, okay? But uh, maybe we can take some questions. I think we have some time, right? Yeah. So we still have uh, 10 minutes. Anyone has any question about the f one of the three workshop about yeah. the? You want it? Oh, one question. Yes, I need to. Yes. Yeah, um, you're using Redux as your state uh, management. Uh, have you used the Mobex or some else state manager? Or do you prefer Redux? Uh, so far, so far in our own uh, project, we are using a lot of Redux. Okay, yeah. we because it, it allows us to do all this optimization, and we are uh, it's quite mature. I didn't, I didn't, we didn't play with Mobex or other state management, so I will not say which one is be is the best. But the Redux is quite uh, is quite famous, and also is is using the concept of flux. Uh, so that's why this is why it become a very streamlined. And it, it's, really do, it's really doing the job that we, we need. But I cannot tell you about the other yeah. the framework because we don't play it to tell you if it's, what are the pros and cons. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, in, it was very interesting how you put this socket, connected this socket to the middleware. I've been wondering how we should do that. I was 
I was thinking we would have to keep the socket in Redux, but that seems that seems in the Redux store, but that seems wrong. So um, I like your way. The problem we have is our login doesn't create. We don't have the socket when we set up the store. It's not created until they do the login. Yeah. So in that case, I was thinking I could just pass an empty object to the middleware and later put the socket. Uh, sorry. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, um, can you repeat the part when you say that when Redux have no store, something like that? Sorry, yeah, so we, we, uh, we don't have the sockets when we first set up the store. Okay. Uh, we haven't created it yet. Yes. It's only when they hit the login button that we create the socket. No, actually, when we apply the middleware, so, so when the when the application loads, the JavaScript actually run the part where we initialize the socket yes, object. I, that's how it works for you. I'm talking about our, our app. Oh, okay. We haven't created the socket yet. Okay. So we don't create it till later. But can I just can I just pass an empty object to the middleware <coughs> and then put the socket into that object later? Would that be a reasonable solution? Um, I think it depends on uh, how we, how do you want to do it because the thing on the socket is that you want to listen to the events, right? So if you're passing like a empty object, uh, when the application load, the socket is not initialized yet at all. Mm. So if any event is coming in, you you can't you can you can't execute anything because the socket is is, is an, an empty object that you're passing in. Yeah. So the way to do it is to to find somewhere when your application loads or before prior to when you need your socket connection. You have to initialize the socket object, and of course listen to the various uh, events that you're listening to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. There's one. The question is, um, <coughs> say, I if there's a, a state that will trigger multiple actions, um, how would you like trigger the actions? Because I tried it in the loop and it was just infinite loop. Um, and uh, my Googling tells me I have to use a batch action. I'm not sure, like, if. And uh, why can't we use it in the loop? That's okay, so um, when you want to dispatch multiple actions, uh, so there's. In Redux X, right, the one that we use. You actually have a, if you look at the documentation, there's actually one uh, function that allows you to dispatch, uh, which you mentioned, batch, right? To dispatch multiple actions. Uh, we are not doing that, but what we are doing is, uh, instead of dispatching multiple actions, because normally when you dispatch multiple actions, it could be, you want to clear this, you want to stop this loader, you want to do that thing. So what we are doing, if you look at our reducer, which we have, right, we have a pipe function, right? So we are actually piping through a different set of mutators. So we are actually only using one action that is like doing a series of uh, things in there. So the good thing is that if you dispatch like multiple actions, your, your application might render a few times, right? So that might be some trade-off with performance. So what we are doing is one action is dispatched, right? Every mutator change the state but the state that we are changing, we are not returning it to the reducer yet. So it doesn't re-render the app. So the, the state from one mutator to the next, right? For example here, you can see we add, add new message. It changes the state. The current state pass to the next state, count mention. It does something to it and pass to the one until it, it ends. So now we have a new state that has been modified by all these mutators. And then we return it to the reducer. And so there's a few changes there. But the app only re-rendered one time. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, we have t-shirts. Uh, I think uh, we we have enough t-shirts, but I don't know about sizes. So. Uh, uh, Please come over uh, and collect your T-shirts. Or, or you can, uh, yeah, we'll distribute it uh, to you guys.
Oh, but that's a different size. Uh, yeah. It's better that they come and get inside the room.